The scripture reading this morning is Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as they or do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. This is God's word. It is true and it is given out of his love. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Before we go to prayer and then back to this text, I want to answer a question that I thought we had answered, but evidently we have not. Where in the world is Jeff Grant? And I assure you, he is not with Waldo. He is on paternity leave, uh, something our human resources team uh, generously gave. Fathers of new babies um, is a paternity leave. So um, Jeff and Chelsea welcomed Daphne into the world about three weeks ago. And so they are just in a time of of, uh, rest and enjoying their new addition to the family. And he will be back with us soon enough. Uh, Matt and Anna Galeski... Uh, are also beginning this journey, although I I saw them walk in. Talk about commitment to the gathering of the Lord's people on the Lord's day. Awesome. So Anna was due this past week, so any minute now, but please wait till the service is over. (laughs) But I will say this is one of the best rooms to be in for any medical issue whatsoever. Sarah's ready to go if need be. But please, seriously, wait until after the service is over. Um, So anyway, I wanted to update you on that. Uh, Tomorrow morning, Lord willing, uh, our college minister, Martin, and Pastor Roddy and I are going to fly out to Indianapolis, and we're going to be attending the Gospel Coalition Conference there. Um, So I'm asking for prayer because we're going to represent a church planting organization that we partner with called Neapolis, New City, from Acts chapter 19. And then... Uh, Roddy will be speaking on a panel there, so you can pray for him. But we're also going, because we are going to try and network with some folks about the potential of a future children's minister, and that is a great need. God's in control, but if you would pray for open doors and divinely appointed conversations, that would be very much appreciated. Okay, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we desperately need you. We need to understand spiritual truth with spiritual hearts, and only you can do that. And I pray for hearts that are hospitable to the Word, hearts that are ready to be transformed, hearts that are prepared to repent of sin that comes to light in terms of this passage, misplaced trust, brokenness. I pray for hearts that are ready to encounter Jesus. In fact, I pray 
that you would deign to use the preacher this morning who is very fallen and finite. Help him to get out of the way so that we see Christ and only Christ. And may we be drawn to him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. His name was Daniel, and his mom got a new job. So they packed up their stuff and their old station wagon, and they headed across the country from Newark, New Jersey, to Reseda, California, where Daniel was going to start a new life in a new high school as a total outcast. He went from Newark, inner city kind of life, to this collar-popping, varnay-wearing, Jimmy Z short-wearing, Southern California high school. And he began to stick out like a sore thumb. In fact, the cool kids started to pick on him in one fateful Halloween party night when he started to flirt with the wrong girl. He got beaten up by these guys that spent their afternoons training at a dojo in town. But out of the mist came the shadowy figure, a figure that we had seen around because he was the caretaker of the apartment complex that Daniel and his mother lived in. And this little guy named Mr. Miyagi saved the day, rescues Daniel, and goes and helps him heal up, at which point they start a relationship. Daniel didn't have a dad, so Mr. Miyagi is going to train this guy not only to be courageous, but to be noble. And he's going to do that through the medium of karate. Now, those of you who are old like me realize I am talking about one of the most fundamental movies from the 1980s, The Karate Kid. And uh, so the story goes that he's training, and there's so many spiritual illustrations from this movie. But I'll just talk about one in particular. It's the last scene of the movie. Daniel's trained up. They're in a karate competition. He's up against Johnny, who is the main you know, antagonist of the story. And Johnny is whooping him pretty bad in this final meet. And the coach of the enemy dojo, you know, is this merciless former Marine. And he wants Johnny just not just to win the match, but like hurt Daniel or Danielson, as I should say. And Dan you're just like, oh man, Danielson's bruised and beat up. And it's this final moment. They're ready to match each other. The referee is about to start the match. And then Daniel goes into the crane. And I'm not going to do this because I'm going to pull a hamstring, of course, up here. But the match starts, and he goes, and the music is building. And Johnny, by the way, doesn't want to do this, right? He even feels bad, but his coach is commanding him. And he, he moves in through the air, and then whack! Johnny gets hit in the side of the head and goes down. I have never been in a movie theater where this has happened since then. I was with my dad, 4th Street, San Rafael Movie Theater. We literally, as a packed theater, went into the air and started high-fiving and hugging each other. <laughs> no joke in that moment. It was epic. Do you ever wish you had a crane kick for some of the hard and junky and complex feelings of your heart? that are so overwhelming. And I didn't plan it this way, but I really think God in his word in Genesis has a theme for us in terms of combating the unbelief that so often leads to worry. And by the way, that's what we called it back in the 80s, worry. And now worry has an IV drip called anxiety. We used to worry just once in a while when life would kind of come at us, but now it's just this steady weight that we feel. And I know that you get annoyed at me and other pastors that pester you about how it's this cultural moment, it's the technology and it's the smartphones, but I listened to two different podcasts who independently from each other interviewed the same professor at San Diego State University, and, and we had a, a graduate of hers in the first service, Dr. Jean Twenge, she just wrote this book, Generations, The Real Difference Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and, the, and Silence and what they mean for America's future. Her point was, and by the way, this former student of hers is not even sure if she's a believer or not. She just crunched the numbers, looked at the empirical data, and she said, sure enough, the smartphone uh, phone is to blame. Uh, Gen Z 
and millennials are by far different than the rest of the four categories. They are the most confident, self-assured, and most anxious of all those six generations, largely because they don't know what to do with all the information coming at, the, at them at the same time, especially the bad news. So here we are with the steady IV drip of all of that stuff leading us to anxiety, what we used to call worry. And I think we have a passage this morning that gives us a crane kick to that worry. And I feel like if we can talk about worry, we can talk about the IV drip that leads to anxiety and doubt and all of these other things. So here's the question I want to answer from our passage this morning. How do we confront worry? How do we confront worry? There's three answers from Genesis 18. Number one, we live faithfully in the day and place God puts us. Number two, we abide in the ability of God Almighty. And third, we trust that God will clear the way. So first, we live faithfully in the day and place God puts us. Verses one through eight. We're not long after chapter 17. We know that because God reiterates the promise that Abraham and Sarah are going to have a child within a year. And there Abraham is, as a Bedouin, living in tents by the Oaks of Mamre, which he's been near for a while, and he's hanging out. But he's not just hanging out, he's waiting, right? He's waiting and waiting and longing. God has made a promise. So his heart is looking at the horizon, and then suddenly three visitors arrive. Verse 2. And they're off for off a while because he's got to get up and run. And here's the thing. In the ancient world, old men do not run. It is shameful. It's disgraceful. Unless you're waiting for God and you realize that God has come into town. And so he runs out. Who are these three guys anyway? Well, from chapter 19, one, we know that two of them are angels. But throughout this text, it is clear one of them is the Lord. And I am not exactly sure how this works because there's only one incarnation, only one God taking up residence in human flesh. But in some form, somehow, one of these guys is the Lord himself. And so there he is, Adonai, my Lord. And one of the things I want us to notice about Abraham's response is that he is hospitable. He is hospitable. He runs to greet them. He gets the kitchen going. He is racing about. He is taking care of them. The thing about worry is it makes us self-focused, inward, self-pitying. Abraham, to the contrary, is believing God. And because of that, he is freed for his day. He can focus on today and the things in front of them. These three guys, he can love well. Sometimes selfish worry makes us wave God off, in fact. Sometimes we're looking down at our feet, moaning and groaning. So when God shows up, we don't even see him. But Abraham is hoping, he's believing. And when he sees the Lord and his two servants, he is off to the races to bless them. By the way, chapter 19 is a contrast story. Chapter 19, among other things, is about a civilization that is inhospitable. We focused on the sexual brokenness of chapter 19, and that is definitely part of it. But both inhospitality and sexual brokenness are a result of the greater problem of idolatry and ungodliness. And that's going to factor in on the last half of our chapter. So a little preview for next week. What is God going to do with the idolaters and the ungodly line of, of, of Cain in the land? So here's the thing that we see Abraham doing is he's believing God for his long-term future so he can be faithful in today, which allows your heart to be occupied with good things so your heart isn't just focused on the things you can't control, which leads to that worry, right? So he's living faithfully in the day that God has given him. The second thing to confront worry, and this is the main thing, so not all these points are equal. I want you to, if you've only got enough energy to stay awake for 10 minutes, this is the 10 minutes, okay? Abide in the ability of God Almighty, 9 through 15. They ask him, where is Sarah, your wife? She matters. The fact that she's in the kitchen is not a sign of her being less important. We have learned from the last chapter she's a partner on this mission, and these messengers want to include her. God has a big message for her. It's said in both 10 and 14. It says this, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, 
shall have a son. This is the same thing that was said to Abraham in chapter 17, verse 21. It used to be a general promise, right? You're going to have an heir. Wow, unbelievable. Now it gets specific. By this time next year, you will be holding this baby. But Sarah is pondering this stuff in her heart. And there's a worry that she expresses. How can this be? How can this be? I am worn out and my Lord is old. Shall I have pleasure? The narrator reminds us of the human obstacles as well. She and Abraham were advanced in age and she was beyond childbearing. We would call this postmenopausal in today's scientific language. Sarah laughs with incredulity. And of course, remember, what does Isaac mean? Laughter. Laughter. And even in our passage, Sarah is considering romance at their age. This pleasure is just a euphemism for sexual intimacy. By the way, I think that's a pretty good sermon application. I wouldn't be too disappointed with that. But nonetheless, she's going, this is impossible. This is impossible. But then the Lord knows her heart. And this expresses his omnipotence because he knows what's going on in her heart from a distance. The Lord knows and he volleys with more promise. And this is it. Here's the heartbeat of the passage. If you're looking for it, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Why is Sarah asking? Why is she laughing? Is anything too hard for the Lord? There's an implied answer to that. So, Let me ask you the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Okay, you answered it the way we often answer it every day in the slog. So answer it the way it should be answered. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Yes. No. (laughs) But that happened in the first service, and it was an immediate sermon illustration. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. No. And some of you are right there. You know the right answer, but you don't know the right answer. And you are caught up in some worry right now, in some anxiety right now, and maybe some doubt right now, because you haven't settled that question yet. Is anything too hard for the Lord? That is what it means to live in the shadow of the Almighty. To really believe that nothing is too hard for him. Therefore, if he makes a promise as unbelievable and crazy as it is, he is going to fulfill his word. Now, the next step as a pastor could be tempting. I I could come up here and say, so believe God for your cancer. Believe God for that lost child. Believe God for a new job. Believe God for financial stability. Believe God for that broken marriage. Meaning, just believe him and next week it'll all be fixed, right? But that is not what's going on in this passage. What's going on in this passage is God revealing a clear word. One of the words to us is, you've got cancer or you've got a lost child or you've, got, you've lost your job, but God is going to meet you in that dark place. God is going to be with you He's going to provide everything you need every day, everything you actually need every day. The next step is believing God can heal those things and restore those things, and he might in this world, but one of the things that we need to believe is that he will restore it one day in full in the final assignment. The next step is believing what God has said in his world, in his word. Sarah and Abraham did not self create the story of Isaac. That's really important. God told them. God told them. It was his clear word and his clear promise. So the application for us is to go to the word. What has the word said? What has the Bible clearly promised to us? And then you can rest in that. And some of it's crazy still. But you say, is anything too hard for God? The other thing I want to note here is the connecting of dots. The promise of Isaac is what leads to the promise of a nation, which leads to Jesus. No Isaac, no Jesus. 
Again, it is super important not to be self-oriented and individualistic as you consider God, God fulfilling his promises to you. He loves you, yes, but his faithfulness to you is also connected to his faithfulness to millions of other people across time and space. Right? So this is, I think, reassuring. God is going to do his work in your life because his work in your life in some mysterious way is connected to his overall grand story and ultimately to bring Jesus back. That's pretty mind-blowing. But in this story, of course, he's going to be faithful to bringing about Isaac because Isaac will lead to the nation and the nation will lead to Jesus and Jesus will lead to your salvation in this room right now. And so what is God's word to us when we go through moments of worry? Trust me, he says. Jesus is Lord over this. Jesus is at work in this. Jesus will hold you in this. Jesus will be back to redeem this soon and very soon. I was with a friend on Friday evening, and he was exhorting me and encouraging me with a, an image that I have heard before, but it was just good to hear again. He said, picture a tapestry, and a beautiful tapestry, woven art, but turn it around. What is on the backside of a tapestry? Have you ever seen it? It's just all these threads and cords and mishmash and knots. And right now in this world, we see the back of the tapestry. Occasionally, God will give us a little sneak peek. and We'll go, oh, just a corner is amazing. One day we will see it. I would argue if you read the book of Revelation, you get a little preview. But we are so frustrated because we see the back of the tapestry and it just does not make sense. There's just random colors and knots and threads coming out. God's word to you is trust him. One day you will see the front of the tapestry and it will be amazing. It will make all of this make sense. So what do you do? You put it in the hands of the Lord. You put it in the hands of the Lord. Worry is about holding things only God can hold. Listen to how King David puts it in Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This is what I know about a weaned child. It is weak. He or she is frail and insufficient. Knows that and so home is in mama's lap. Falling asleep. Mom will take care of it. Our God will take care of it. You put it in his hands. You put it in his hands. Now, the Lord has said, why is Sarah laughing? And there she is listening in. And Sarah denied it. Verse 15, I did not laugh, or I like to interpret the Hebrew this way. Yo, I didn't laugh. And the Lord said, um, yes, you did. <laughs> And I can imagine the Lord thinking, but Sarah, I love you so much, and I'm going to keep my word. So abide in the ability of God Almighty. Now, for time's sake, we didn't have this read for the scripture reading, but I want to briefly cover the last part of this passage, 16 to 33. And here is the final third way we confront worry. We trust that God will clear the way. Let me just read 16 through 21. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they 
They have done all together according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So this seems like a weird gear shift. I'm reading this and I'm going, how did we get from the three guys and the promise of a son and Sarah being encouraged and suddenly we're off to Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> I, I don't think it was some kind of, I'll stop writing for now, go get a sandwich and come back and forget your place as the narrator. I actually think the two scenes are very related. Scene number one, God reiterates his promise of Isaac and the kingdom to come. Scene number two, there's occupants in the land already. And that land is destined for the people of God. And we got all these ungodly people in there, so God has to clear the way. God has a promise. If there's an obstacle to the promise, God's going to clear out the obstacle. That's the two scenes relating together. And this is part of the unfolding story of God. And again, Abraham is being invited into this knowledge because God has this amazing plan through him and he wants Abraham to know this is going to so happen, this is so for real, that this massive valley in front of you, full of these people, I am going to clear those people so that I can place your descendants there because your descendants are going to fill this valley. So the Lord sets his face to purify the land and the narrator is using human attributes to explain God, to clarify God's purposes, not to limit God to like hands and eyes and everything, but he's using this language of God coming down and checking things out. This takes us back to Genesis 11 with Babel, God coming down and checking things out at Babel. Well, we're at another moment like that. And God says, hey, Abraham, I'm going to let you in on this because one day you're going to have to defend this. One day you're going to have to lead your family. One day you're going to have to speak for me. Abraham, I am going to argue as being called to the prophetic office. What is a prophet? But the person that God speaks to and he says, pass that word on. So this is the moment that Abraham is being called to that office. And we have a quick picture of God's perfect justice. When God says, hey, there's this outcry, and then 21, I'm going to go down and I'm going to check it out just to confirm it. This is the text's way of saying God is not like a general sitting in his office at headquarters with his feet propped up on the desk and he's smoking a cigar and reading the newspaper. And in comes a lieutenant and says, sir, we have insurgents in sector five. And without double checking at all, God, without even removing his eyes from the newspaper, just says, okay, send in the F-16s. So many times that's the way we view God's justice. We struggle sometimes with God's justice and his vanquishing of whole people groups in the Old Testament because we picture God like that general. That God is not like that general. God is the general that will go to the battlefield to double check to make sure there is in fact ungodliness and unholiness that has to be dealt with. The enemies of God's people and the enemies of God's fame. God's his justice is perfect, in other words. Now, we have this next scene. I'm not going to read it all. It's very comical. Many of you know it. Um, we find out in the next chapter that Abraham's nephew, Lot, is in Las Vegas. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he doesn't want them to be wiped out. So he says, all right, uh, Lord, can we talk about this? What if 50 righteous people live in, 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 in Sodom. God's like, okay, if there's 50. By the way, this is, God's got a smile on his face when he's doing this, all right? Well, uh, 45? Yeah, I, I can do 45. 40? Yeah, and, and it keeps going, and I'll just read verse 32. And then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He gets him down to 10. And he answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now, next week we'll check this out, but many of you know how the story goes. Ten, ten didn't work either. And again, I think here's the point. God is perfectly merciful, perfectly wise, perfect in his judgment. His judgments are always proportional, and they have no unintended consequence. There's no friendly fire. There's no collateral damage. There's no unfortunate casualties in the fires of God's judgment. God judges 
everything that actually deserves judgment, peoples, institutions, and places. God's judgment, by the way, is an act of blessing. There is no blessing until God wipes out the anti-blessings. This is God's love. And so he devastates things that are anti-love. This is God's work. This is the other side of the coin of nothing is too hard for the Lord. God is able to show infinite mercy and God is able to overthrow his enemies and yours. So he puts evil and justice and broken systems and societal evil and your own sin into his mighty hands. And by the way, at this point, it is good to be reminded that this moment in Sodom and Gomorrah, and this will be a thing next week that we'll emphasize, is a precursor to the judgment that is many more scales larger, which is the last judgment. And you and I, believer, deserve at the last judgment to have fire and brimstone come down on us. But it's not. Why? Because the, the fire and brimstone of all fire and brimstones rain down on Jesus in our place. And so this story is about God's justice, but also his crazy grace through Jesus Christ. The one that took the fire and brimstone for us in our place so that we could receive the love and mercy of God. So now we have had three crane karate kicks to worry. But now I want to answer the question that is all wonderful and good. But how do I get that glorious truth into my heart? Because there's an 18-inch problem in all of us. And it is the distance between our cranium and our heart. Right? How do we travel that 18 inches? And I think it is ultimately prayer. So... My last point, finally, give up and pray. Give up and pray. I was listening to an interview of Carl and Karen Ellis. They're both on staff at Reformed Theological Seminary, wonderful leadership couple together. And they were talking about struggles in life and worry. And I love this image that Karen gave about trials. She said it's like a Pez dispenser. There's always another one. Just when you thought, oh, we got through that trial, next one, next one, you ever feel like that? And she talked about a moment that she and Carl were in bed getting ready to go to sleep, and they were having this family weight, a complex matter going on in the family. And she's all worked up and worried, and she looks over, and Carl's all calm, and she's like, Carl, why aren't you worried about this? And he says, I care. I'm just not going to be worried. I care. I'm just not going to be worried. Have you ever been in a situation like that where you're looking at a situation and you're like, that is so big, I am honoring the gravity of the situation by being worried about it. And you look over and someone else is like, yeah, I see everything you see. I'm just, I'm just not worried. And you're like, you're callous or you don't understand this or you're just apathetic or maybe that's been said to you. It's reversed, right? Right? Like, what's going on there? How come some people worry about everything and other people can just care about those things? I actually think there's three groups of people that respond to crisis in different ways. I do think there's a group called the callous. But that's wrong, okay? Let's all agree that's wrong. Let's push them off the table. So that leaves two people, the worriers and the carers. And I would say in most situations among the Christian community, okay, these are people filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll say that 10% are callous, okay? They're clearly sinning. But then I would say there's 60 to 70% of a Christian community that's going to respond to crisis with worry and only about 10 to 30% who are able to care. What's the difference between a worry and a care? Someone who worries, they see the problem but they don't see God. They see the problem, but they don't see God. And so they become demanding, 
and grouchy and accusatory, and the ultimate solutions are often found in human solutions and in institutions. They often become legalistic, putting words in God's mouth and binding the conscience with things that are not taught in the word. And here's the technical term for it. They are just not fun to be around. Okay? Then there are the people that are caring. They see the problem. They do. And they see God. And they see God. They are burdened, but not bitter. They are grieved, but not grouchy. The solutions lay in heaven coming to earth. Let me say that again. The solution is heaven coming to earth. And I do believe in this time that a little bit of heaven drips onto the earth. And we should seek that. Absolutely. God wants a little bit of heaven to drip onto the earth in your life and in the Bible church's life and through the Bible church to the triangle and beyond. Absolutely. But the fullness of heaven will not come until the final day. And those who care are okay with that. And they're okay with that because that is clearly taught in the scriptures. When I was in middle school, I had a Daniel son like journey. My parents moved us to a new community. Now, it was only five miles away, but very different. Some of you that know my story are smiling a little bit because this all occurred within this area in Northern California called Marin County, which is where hot tubbing culture and yuppies were invented, okay? So you're like, you went from nine to 10 on a scale of yuppie. But really, it, uh, Mill Valley, where I grew up, it, it had its like normal vibe, and I was part of that. And then we moved to Tiburon, which was absolutely the pop collar, Varney wearing culture. And I did not want to move, and I felt totally out of place, and uh, it was just hard. And so I was already an anxious kid, and I remember my Sunday night ritual. Starting about post-dinner, I just got knotted up inside thinking about Monday coming, every Sunday. Oh, I can still feel that to this day. And it got really bad, and I came to a crisis point. I knew that I either had to drown or give up. And you're like, what's the difference between those two? A total world of difference. Drowning is seeing a problem and refusing to see God. And so, whoosh, down you go. Giving up is, there is a massive problem, and I have an even bigger God. I can't do anything about my problem. God, I guess I have to put this in your hands. And so I learned, or started to learn the art of doing that, that I could not control my future. And by the way, so much of my worry was me deciding what the future looked like, and then when I actually got to the future, it wasn't that bad. But I decided I needed to change some stuff. So starting in high school, some stuff changed. Partially by the help of my parents' financial persuasion, I started to read the Bible every day. And parents, I think this is a wonderful way to bribe your children. <laughs> Full stop. Pay them to read the Bible every day. That's what my mom did. If you will read the Bible for five minutes before school every morning, I will give you an allowance. And I have never stopped. Stopped going to school. Longer than five minutes. And that is where I began to fall in love with God's word. Actually, let me put it this way. I began to fall in love with God through his word. And his word started to fill my heart with truth rather than the foolishness and lies that were creating my worry. Then I did this thing called praying. And I started to pray as worry washed over me. Not 10 minutes into the process, but immediately. And worry has not stopped washing over me. In fact, in some ways, it has gotten worse as life has gone on. Friends, start to have children, and then you will understand worry. <laughs> but you just pray. You pray. One of the things about this story that we cannot forget is that Abraham and Sarah were in the presence of the Lord. 
Abraham was speaking with the Lord, and the Lord was speaking to Abraham. Abraham was in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord was in the presence of Abraham. And I think prayer is a with God moment. It is not just a, oh, help me, but it is, I want to be in your lap like a weaned child, Lord. That is what it means to put it in the, in the, in the hands of the Lord, is to pray. Pray it down into your heart. Pray it down into your heart. You're struggling with the cancer. Pray it down into your heart. You're struggling with the lost job. Pray it down into your heart. The lost child, pray it down into your heart. Whatever it is, pray it down into your heart. God has always met me there. Always met me there. And so can I suggest some application? That whenever we gather at a formal event for the Chapel Hill Bible Church, we pray, and not just to open the ceremonies. We pray. We pray for things that God must do and will do that are beyond human capability. Like we're praying that we will be a church that equips you to serve Jesus well, that forms a community based in the love of Jesus, that reaches the triangle and beyond. That's impossible. Unless God is in it. And we pray. May I suggest we make a much bigger deal about our monthly prayer and praise gathering. We have a wonderful core group of people that comes to that. And I, I know we're real busy. That's another part of the, um, uh, the modern dilemma is how busy we are. We need our weekend. Hard to think about having a Sunday night where we give up our rest to come. But friends, how can we not? I'm going to argue that you have a more restful life if we do this. I, I'm just going to put this out there, but I think this is a realistic goal. This is just coming from me. What if 80% of our members regularly came out to the praise and prayer gathering once a month, which would mean we could only fit in this room? And we will do that because we're embracing our insufficiency and our dependence, but also because we just love being with the Lord together in a special way. May I ask you to consider giving that one Sunday evening a month for the sake of prayer together. Life groups. I, I haven't visited every life group. Maybe you do this. Keep doing it. But what if life groups made prayer a really big part of meeting together? Not just the thing you do to wrap it up and then you go and have cake together. But what if you really made it about serious, concerted, dependent, praising prayer? In fact, let's pray now. Lord, just like the bargaining scene between Abraham and God, I know, ultimately, no human being changes your actual plan. You can do anything without us. But prayer is your invitation to be with you in your lap as we give you our need and we give you our brokenness and we give you our sin and we give you our hopes. Thank you for the gift of prayer. So now I believe that you are going to work. There are people in this room who are struggling to answer the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, prove to their hearts the answer is no. A resounding no, an eternal no, nothing is too hard for you. And so take that thing in their life and put it up against your infinite El Shaddai power and help them to feel encouraged and hopeful and full of gratitude. For those who are seeing just a mess of string and knots, the back of the tapestry, and it makes no sense to them. And they're wondering, why do I keep threading this needle? Remind them, there is a picture so glorious and beautiful on the other side that one day they will fall down and worship you. I pray for anybody in this room 
who doesn't know you. That has a lot more to do with Sodom and Gomorrah than they do with your people this morning. Show them that Jesus took the fire and brimstone so that they can have your love. Draw them to you. Draw their hope to you. Draw their faith to you. May they receive Jesus as Savior this morning. I pray for the young ones in this room who are just starting to think about the long-term big life stuff. May they leave this room with a truth that will last. There is nothing too hard for you. There is nothing too hard for you. And Lord, I pray that we would in fact become a deeply prayerful church because we are so dependent, we are so needy, and we so hunger to be with you. Lord, thank you in advance for the ways that you are going to answer this prayer. And I pray it in the beautiful and glorious and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.